Hello, my name is Ryan Murphy and I want to share with you some of the best practices that I have come up with uh, to teach honors geometry at really high levels. I believe if we incorporate smart technology into our, our classrooms, specifically a smart notebook software and a smart board, we would be able to make our, our teaching more efficient, giving us more time to be able to teach prerequisite material that might cause kids to stumble uh, with new content also to change the way that we present the content to make it more memorable as we are providing uh, captivating visualizations of the concepts that we're uh, we're investigating uh, also making them more memorable and allowing us to have more time to get into extension activities that are even beyond the scope of our course so uh, without any further ado i want to show you some of the things that i've developed some of my best practices to hopefully inspire you uh, to do the same so uh, whenever we're teaching vocabulary especially this year because we were doing it online um, I'm trying to teach points, lines, and planes, which all exist in space, and they have certain properties as they interact with each other. Usually this is nice to be able to do in person, but it's really hard to get kids to be able to visualize this through videos. Um, but So one of the examples that we have, our, our segment, which is a set of all collinear points between two endpoints. So um, here I have uh, three collinear points, points A, B, and C, that all exist on the same line. They can be annotated. Uh, there are three segments here. We have segment A, B, segment B, C, and segment A, C. So as I, I press these here, you can see I can animate them as they come into play. So segment A, B has endpoints A and B. So it's a set of all collinear points that exist strictly between A and B. Uh, then we have B, C as well, which, co which are all collinear points that strictly exist between B and C. We can also go into and talk about how, even though it looks like a solid line, it's actually the collection of all infinitely many uh, collinear points and it's just because there's so infinitely many of them all packed together that they look like a solid line and then we have a c which has endpoints at a and c and it's a set of all of those points and then from this you might actually be able to uh, you might have observed that the segment a b plus segment b c would give us segment a c the collection of all equidistant points between a and b and all the points between a and c together would give us a c and that would actually be the segment addition postulate planes are also very challenging for students to visualize and cross sections of three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional objects with planes is usually one of the easier ways to get them to be able to see it so uh, planes are geometric figures with two dimensions length and width that extend forever in all directions so uh, if you just draw a rectangle with arrows the students often won't see the depth of it but if you put it on an intersection with a three-dimensional object then they can see uh, you can see that the three points here a b and g are the three points that we're going to use to define the plane as plane a b g uh, we can choose any three points that actually intersect uh, that are on the plane. They just have to be non-collinear points, otherwise the plane's allowed to rotate 360 degrees and is not well defined. Um, by showing them the, the cube here, you can see the, the solid black uh, line segments here and then the segments that are faded out in the back, which shows them perspective of what is behind the plane and what is in front of the plane. They can imagine the cross section as we're splitting this plane in half. This is also very helpful on the homework where we have, for instance, number 14. Uh, we want to shade the plane that contains the points E, H, and B. So I can go through and select the points uh, E, H, and B. And you'll notice this theme quite often, but um, everything starts out black unless I have color coding that's going in with the formulas. The reason I do this is so that the slides are allowed to evolve as we process through the information from the perspective of what the students would see on their own worksheets. So by selecting E, H, and B, I am uh, directing the student's attention to the three points that it goes through. Now the hard part would be trying to imagine what a plane might look like that would go through those points. So uh, we can actually sketch lines connecting those two and uh, connecting this point here and then they hopefully would be able to see that it would actually split it diagonally across here and I can actually fade it in so that they can see exactly what that would look like. Uh, again with translucent images so they can see what parts are behind and what parts are in, in front of it. Uh, this gets even more difficult when we don't have rectangular cross sections, such as in um, plane A, C, H. So we have A, uh, C, and then H over here. And if I connect all of those lines together, uh, you'll notice that it's actually going to be a triangular shape. So our cross section is actually kind of cutting the corner off of one of our, uh, of our cube here. And so it would actually look like this image here. Uh, now, keep in mind that this is just the intersection, not the plane, because planes actually extend forever in all directions. So the intersection is just giving it a context so that we know where it exists in space. Um, but I'll, by drawing it in both ways, showing it what they see on their paper, and then showing what actually the plane is, consisting of all possible points that are coplanar with those three points. 
Uh, we can also, whenever we're dealing with polyhedrons, we can show them how the polyhedrons are formed. And from the perspective of somebody who actually draws polyhedrons and creates shape art through a smart notebook, it's actually really helped me understand how you would draw these in the first place. So for instance, um, identifying the base of the pyramids and the prisms is, is really the first step to solving uh, surface area or volume. Um, for polyhedrons. So what we want to do is be able to distinguish the difference between a pyramid and a prism. Well, we start out with their bases, which often are going to be shapes that are other than the lateral areas. And then with pyramids, which is pretty easy for the students to understand, they just simply go for all the vertices on the base, go to a single apex or a single point that's uh, on, on a different plane. Now, um, that would give us a rectangular pyramid, which is named by its base of a rectangle. Uh, this one's actually called a cone. It doesn't kind of have, it's not a pyramid, but it, you know, it is a pyramid, it just doesn't have a name. Hexagonal pyramid, triangular pyramid, and then a pentagonal pyramid. One thing that I always like to point out is that all the lateral surfaces that are going around the base are always going to be the shapes of triangles. They're always going to be triangles because they're always going to a single point. So the easiest way to identify a base of a prism is it's going to be the shape that's not a triangle. And then if everything's a triangle, well, it's the triangle. <laughs> it's one of the triangles, basically. All right, then the next step that I like to show them is how we would construct the pyramid, which is going to have, as a description, another congruent base on a parallel plane. Now, that's a description, not a definition, because we actually can violate that. Um, and I'm not going to get into that part, but I definitely do that with my students. So by showing them it kind of coming up in this, obviously that makes it memorable. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun for me to make too. Um, but they can see that there are two bases and all we're doing is connecting uh, the top base to the bottom base with the lateral areas that are going around. That's also the height of our prism, which would be important when we we're doing calculating the surface area and the volume. So they can see the distinction between a rectangular pyramid and a rectangular prism, uh, between a cone and a cylinder, a hexagonal pyramid and a hexagonal prism, and, 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 and vice versa. So really powerful visuals it makes it a whole lot easier to distinguish between the two and to teach a very important concept of how to identify the base as it is the first step and to find the, the volume and the surface area of our three-dimensional polyhedrons. You're probably starting to notice some common themes with the color coding of my assignments. So the text, uh, the title text is always going to be this burgundy. That tells people when they see that color that that's going to be title information, not necessarily something specific to that problem. So by seeing that, that color, it just frees up so that they know that, that text, uh, the context of what that text is trying to do. Also, you'll see color coding within the formulas and within uh, sort of like our answer banks as we are processing through the information. This is going to be by color coding, it's tying links between B and B, the base, the area of the base, and the perimeter and the slant height and the cursive L. It's important to keep these color codings consistent throughout the entire unit as students are subliminally building connections between uh, the, the context of the formula, the context of the actual working out the problem, and the diagrams themselves. But it's important important also not to give out too much information at the beginning. The only things that are color coded at this point in the initial phase of the slide are going to be from the answer bank and also over here and our formula. So what I need the students to do is to process through this information just in the same way uh, I need to go through it in the same way that students would seeing it on their paper. All they see is black text. So uh, what I need them to do is to first identify the base and we would talk through this. Uh, we would talk about why the square, the rectangle, it is a square because there are both six, but why the square is the base and not one of the triangles. Well, because it's a pyramid and all of the lateral surfaces that are going around the base are clearly triangles. So the only thing that's not a, uh, the only face that's not a triangle would be our base, which would have to be our square. So then once we identify that as our base, I can simply click here. It's really cool because it shows up and fades in on the actual three-dimensional object of the diagram and a two-dimensional net as I'm still scaffolding uh, the student's understanding from being able to just look at a three-dimensional object to being able to see how we calculate the surface area with the net as well. So um, then we're able to find the area of the base. Six times six would be 36 meters squared. Notice that all of this is faded in and ready to go so that I can direct the students to the information and I'm, they're not waiting on me to pick up pens or to switch colors and pens and stuff like that. Also, it's already been all thought out beforehand, so I'm less likely to make mistakes. If I do make a typo or mistake, I just edit it and fix it before the next hour. Next thing we want to do to find the lateral area is to find the perimeter. Now the perimeter is going to be this width here of our lateral area. It's the same perimeter that we have going all the way around the base. So what is the perimeter of the base? Well, 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6, because it is a square, would be 6 times 4, which is 24 meters. Then I need to find the height of these triangles to find the lateral area. Well, that height is going to be the slant height, which in this case is going to be 8. 
so our slant height is 8. So um, all I have to do now to find the area of all these triangles is to multiply this uh, perimeter of 24 times the slant height of 8, then divide it by 2 because we're wanting the triangles. That's why it's this part of the formula, perimeter times slant height divided by 2. So when I do that, I get 96 square meters. So the lateral area is 96 square meters. That's going to be all the triangles. Then we just have to add our one base to it because it is a, a pyramid that only has one base. So 96 plus the original 36 is going to give us a total of 132 meters squared. So this is one of my favorite slides. So previously, we will talk about the relationship between the surface area of a prism and a, uh, and a pyramid and how the pyramid has half the surface area of the prism. And it shows up in our formula as well. And on the nets is pretty cool. Now we want to do the same concept between volume to try to estimate what we think the volume of a pyramid is going to be. So we talk about uh, how we find the volume of a prism by finding the area of the base, which in this case for a Rubik's cube would be 9. And then every single layer that we add on to that is going to be another layer of nine. So nine times the number of layers, which would have three layers all together, would give us a total volume of 27 cubic centimeters. If, now what happens as we try to do the same thing with the pyramid? Oh, this is so cool. All right, so as we uh, increase layer by layer, at first there's only a small amount that's missing, but as we increase and go up higher to the second layer or to the third layer, we're now removing more and more uh, volume or material from the, the cube. So what's cool is if you view this from one side from the front face uh, basically what we're doing is we're making a triangle out of out of this rectangle we're making a triangle which means we're cutting the volume in half so that tells us that our our volume of the pyramid has to be less than half because we're not only cutting it from a uh, half from one perspective but then we're cutting uh, an additional half but it's not really the whole half because of the top parts appear you know is, is going to a point and so uh, it's really difficult to explain without the use of calculus and integration uh, where the one-third base times height comes from but you can at least show the students that it has to be more than one quarter which is half of a half and less than uh, than one just one half so it's somewhere between a fourth and a half of the volume of the prism and that's actually where it's a third so uh, we go through uh, this whole process and, it, and it's really helpful to show uh, to get kids to think about that and it's really really fun in the the visuals are just beautiful. So uh, an example of solving a problem with, uh, with, with volume, again, color coding everything in the formula and in the answer bank over here, but not on the text itself. So the first thing we have to do is identify the base. So see, since we see all the triangular lateral areas going around, that means that the square on the bottom has to be our base. So as I touch here, this, the base will be color coded and so as we're building that information it's easy for us to sort what information we've already processed because it's been color coded. So 8 times 8 would give us a, a total area of 64 inches squared. Next thing we want to do is find the height. So how many layers of that would we have? Well there's 8 on the bottom layer for the first inch and then there's 10 inches altogether. So our height is going to mean that we're going to have 10 layers of that. So 64 times 10 but because this is a pyramid it's going to be the base times height of divided by three. So we can put that in the calculator um, and I don't have to do it because it's already like pre-done for me, but we are going to get a repeating decimal there. So one more thing I can show is just an investigation of some really, uh, of some, some odd shapes that we can actually now find the volume of and just kind of relating them all together. So all of these uh, shapes here, they have the exact same uh, base of a circle with a radius of r. So we're going to find the volume of them in terms of r, which would be like a generic, kind of like a unit circle idea of way of figuring this stuff out. So we have a cone, we have a, a, a hemisphere, we have a cylinder with a height or radius of 5. All these have a radius of 5 as well for their height. And then we have a, a sphere. So for the base, we have pi times a radius squared times the height of another radius divided by 3. That comes from our formula. So altogether, this would have a volume of 1 3rd pi r cubed. The next thing we would have over here is our hemisphere, which we have actually talked about before, kind of using integration, but uh, that that has a volume of 2 thirds pi r cubed. Then with our cylinder with a base of pi r squared, or sorry, pi r, yeah, pi r squared times another radius would give us pi r cubed or 3 thirds or 1 pi r cubed. If you notice the pattern, we're increasing by 1 third pi r cubed each time. Then as we get to the volume of the sphere, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed from our formula, which is twice the value of the 2 thirds pi r cubed, again from integration if we do the calc, but that's okay. Uh, we can see this lovely pattern. So we go from 1 3rd pi r cubed to 2 3rds pi r cubed to 3 3rds pi r cubed to 4 3rds pi r cubed. So these, um, 
they're all building by the same increment of pi r cubed. And what I like to do here is actually show them with uh, geosolids, uh, filling it with water or with sand. I usually use sand because it's less of a mess. Um, that if we have this uh, this cone, it would take two of those to fill it into uh, the hemisphere, and three of them would fill the cylinder, and four of them would fill the uh, the sphere itself. So really cool stuff, cool applications we can do. So I also uh, love that GeoGebra widgets are built into uh, built into the SmartBoard software. So what this allows me to do is to show students uh, properties of shapes, like for instance a rhombus that I've constructed, and then allow them to build their own conjectures on what they think the properties are just by using their observation as we allow this to move around in space that's constrained by obviously having four congruent sides is what makes it a rhombus, but what other properties follow from having those four congruent sides. So um, just from looking right off the bat, they might notice that we have uh, perpendicular diagonals. The students might also notice that these two angles have been bisected or cut in half by the diagonals. And so diagonals are bisecting each other and they're gonna be perpendicular. Uh, and, but what's cool is that we can show them this as it moves around in space. Now those four sides are all still the same. And you notice that no matter where I, I stop it, they're always going to bisect the angles. And as, the, uh, as this moves around in space as well, you'll notice those diagonals are always going to be perpendicular to each other for our rhombus. So you also might be used to seeing rhombuses shaped like that, but it's okay. I'm just setting it up here where it looks more like a kite, because by the way, a rhombus is a kite. So the properties of our diagonals, we have two of them. We discovered that the, they, the diagonals bisect the angles. The diagonals are also always going to be perpendicular to each other. Now, after discovering that, going through the process, making conjectures, we can actually go through the rigor of proving it. Um, on the next slide, which is kind of nice. So rhombuses are parallelograms with four congruent sides. Um, and so they have two sets of isosceles triangles. So if all four of the sides are congruent, we also know that this side is gonna be congruent to itself by the reflexive property, telling us that this triangle and this triangle are congruent to each other. That means that their angles are all going to be the same by the corresponding parts of congruent triangles, meaning these two angles are gonna be bisected by this diagonal. Now I can show them that there's actually two sets of these. So we have another one here. Uh, again, this diagonal is reflective, it's congruent to itself. And so all three of the sides Sides of these triangles are congruent. I could even fold the rhombus in half, which I have one at school, uh, that a paper copy of a rhombus that I fold in half to show them that they're all the same triangles. Um, and by the same thing without loss of generality, we also know that these angles are going to be bisected. So if I bring back the other diagonal here, we can uh, show that all three of the sides are going to be congruent to each other, meaning uh, the diagonals are going to be perpendicular to each other and they're all right triangles. So this triangle is congruent to this one and this one and this one by side, 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 because they're all congruent sides. That also shows us that diagonals bisect each other, but that was actually, I believe, a property of parallelograms. So the diagonals bisect the angles and the diagonals are also gonna be perpendicular to each other. So once we've investigated all of these shapes uh, using GeoGebra, we can start to build the properties together. In fact, build together the the entire quadrilateral family tree, um, showing how the properties of quadrilaterals are inherited by the entire quadri uh, quadrilateral family tree, and then kites um, inherit properties from rhombuses, inherit properties from kites, uh, parallelograms and their entire family are all related with the same properties of parallelograms. But as we move further down, they start to develop their own individual, um, their own individual properties that that came from some other place. But um, that's where you kind of get into some interesting side stories. But I won't I won't bore you with that. Another thing that we can do is actually um, with the smart board is integrate beautiful visuals from the real world. So geometry, uh, geometria uh, comes from the Greek, which means to measure the world around you essentially. So uh, there are tons of pictures that you can use and, and be able to draw you know, on top of them or annotate them to be able to show students how we would measure or how geometry is shown in the real world. It's, it's, a, it's a math topic or subject that's made to be applied uh, with beautiful visuals. And so if they're, they're visual learners like I am, they're really gonna love this stuff. So uh, this is a really a, a slide. It's like a hook question or a slide that I put on the board at the very beginning. So it tells them, obviously we're dealing with transformations. We're gonna be talking about reflections today and clearly you can see some reflections. So then we get into uh, the axis of the reflection 
functions, we talk about how it's the uh, only the y values that are changing from this point going straight down here from a the pre image to a prime the image of the reflection. Also, we'll talk about how the distance is going to be the same. So whatever distance we have above the line of reflection, we're gonna have the same distance below it. Uh, we can also uh, point out this point here has an image of the reflection down here, the highest point we have here, C goes to C prime here as well. So um, just beautiful images that we can incorporate pretty easily into our lessons. Another uh, fun thing we do with transformations is enlargement. So one of our, our my favorite things that I get to do is do a lot of shape art. One of the shape arts that we do is uh, I draw a puppy out of shape art and then we blow up the puppy by a scale factor of two and then shift it to the right uh, by four. It's a lot of fun. Uh, my students enjoy it and they feel guilty about f having fun blowing up puppies. I don't know they have problems. So anyway, uh, an enlargement is basically a dilation by some scale factor that's larger than one. So if we have a scale factor of two, then our rule is our pre image, our X and Y turns into the image of the enlargement, which is K times X and K times Y. So if we're going to enlarge this by a scale factor of two, our triangle ABC is now going to be twice as far away from the origin. And it's going to be blown up with an area that's four times as big or the scale factor squared. All right, so the original image, uh, the original point two, three, a the pre image now gets multiplied by two, which is now going to be four and six so students can call that out. It's pretty simple. And then as I push this point here, it's actually going to graph it out for me. So I'm not wasting any time uh, swapping pens or picking up pens and making sure it all looks good. It's already pre done for me, which is lovely. Uh, three, one turns into six and two, which can be graphed here. So that's now twice as far away. You might be noticing there's also a pattern here where everything traces back to the origin. We'll get to that in a second. So then C is one, two, which is now going to be two, four and graphs out the whole image of the of the dilation. So notice the area is now four times as big. Each one dimensional unit, including the perimeter, is now going to be two times as big. And they're all twice as all the points are twice as far away from the origin as we started. So this actually brings us to the next point which is uh, kind of a blending between one point perspective uh, drawings and art and dilation. So by putting uh, the front face of these houses on a, uh, a Cartesian plane, we can show how they, they plot back and, and trace back to the, uh, the vanishing point and how all of the uh, all the parallel faces will, will be tracing back there as well, which is beautiful by some scale factor. So if I take the point negative 16, 6, multiply by a scale factor of 1 half, that's going to give me the point negative 8 and 3, which should be graphed right here. Uh, same thing that can be graphed out to negative 6 and 1, I believe, which is right here, and then negative 6 and 2, which should be right here. So noticing that all of these are going to be on the lines tracing back, and then we just simply uh, connect the dots, which will create this really really long uh, house which is really really cool so fun stuff uh, a great uh, kind of cross-curricular blend between um, one point perspective and art which a lot of my students really enjoy art and it's not something I'm really talented at unless you call digital art a talent but you know um, it's not something that I really got into whenever I was in school but a lot of my students really enjoy it. And once they see this, they can see the connection between the Cartesian plane and dilations and art they're never going to forget this stuff. Then we have rotational symmetry, which is a really easy and fun day. Uh, but there's lots of real world applications for rotational symmetry, and we need to be showing students these. Most of them are going to be like starfish and butterflies and um, and snowflakes. But I like to show like a masculine example as well, which are like the spokes that we have uh, from these rims. Um, and this is really it has eight sides. So it's really like a, a regular octagon. So we can do 360 degrees divided by eight, which is going to leave us with 45 degrees. So we have an angle of rotational symmetry of 45 degrees, we can actually measure that out with the built in uh, protractor tools here uh, in SmartBoard. And I can even export those angles. So that should be 45 degrees, which I believe is right there, and export the angle. And then we can measure it uh, and make sure that we actually got it right. So yes, that is going to be 45 degrees, which is kind of cool. Um, that we have all those built-in features. Uh, and the most important thing is that this is a rotational symmetry, meaning the spokes would line up again every time this rotates 45 degrees. Um, and so naturally, of course, the image rotates. So uh, <laughs> seeing students. Uh, reactions every time I show this. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, so anyway, every time I rotate the tire 45 degrees, it's going to match up with those two vertices again, right? Because it's really in the shape of a regular octagon. Of course, it spins really fast. Uh, but this, it's not impossible. <laughs> now I'm showing you my tricks. But 
uh, we'll get into all that. Anyway, so we also can use compasses and constructions, which I do quite a lot with my kids. Uh, and, and it's something we call uh, angle side side or a money side money side, also known as a donkey postulate because uh, it spells out a bad word. Of course, kids will always remember that too. Uh, if I give you the same angle, the same side and same side in that order, angle side side, angle side side. So all I have to do uh, is copy this four, this length of four with my compass at the end of the seven. Um, and then whenever I rotate this with a compass, what we end up seeing is that there's actually two possible solutions with uh, two possible triangles with the angle side side of 37 and 4, 30 degrees 7 and 4. So the donkey postulate doesn't work because it's ambiguous because we don't know if we're referring to the, uh, the obtuse triangle or the acute triangle. And so this is a really good visual illustration of why the donkey postulate does not work, why we don't use that word in my class, and unless of course it's a right triangle, then then we call it the hypotenuse leg theorem. Uh, I want this so bad, um, but it looks like it's homemade and I don't think any company has made it. Otherwise, I'd probably be writing a grant for one of these because it is so dope. Uh, showing the students uh, through, through this GIF or GIF, I don't even know how to pronounce it, um, that the volume of the, the two, the A squared and the B squared fills exactly the volume of the C squared from this right triangle is a visual representation of volume and the Pythagorean theorem. Now to get this image to stop, <laughs> I just click on it and it fades in another one. Uh, that's a still. And that allows me to explain how here we have the side lengths of the legs A squared and the B when we square them and how that equaled the volume of the C squared, which is the Pythagorean theorem. So really cool, powerful visuals to illustrate the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, GeoGebra widgets also come into play and they have some really, really beautiful ones for the Pythagorean theorem, showing them that the three squared plus the four squared is equal to the five squared in this case. Uh, but more importantly, what happens whenever we change the angle? Uh, remember that the Pythagorean theorem is based on the uh, the condition that it's a right triangle. If it's a right triangle, then the Pythagorean theorem is true. So what happens if it's an acute triangle? Well, now the C shrunk, right? The A and the B essentially stay the same, but the C is now shrunk. The C is now 3.75 instead of five. So the C squared is no longer equal to the A squared plus the B squared. So it's only, and what happens when it's an obtuse triangle, which has some really cool applications for uh, covariance and the Pythagorean theorem of statistics, by the way, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, when they're not actually independent uh, random events. Anyway, cool stuff. Then again, now the C is too large, and so the C squared is gonna be larger than the A squared plus the B squared. So it's only when we have 90 degrees uh, that it's a right triangle that the A squared plus B squared is going to be equal to the C squared. I think you can also move this around. Yeah, it's so cool. And show them that this is true for all values. Uh, the C will increase at the rate of the B squared plus the A squared, oh, fun stuff. There's also a visual proof that you can show them, which I have my own versions, but um, if we show the first step, how we replicate our triangle on the other side, the second step, we can add those uh, a and B dimensions to there. So we have A squared plus B squared and then four of these rectangles, okay? And then if we do the same thing with these four rectangles or square triangles, sorry, going all the way around, you'll notice that this one also has a C squared with four of these red triangles. And so if we compare these two areas, um, they're the same. And so the missing space of the A squared and the B squared has to be equal to the C squared. So I like to show these with visual proofs with tiles, but the uh, GeoGebra widget does well as well. Uh, so both of these have the exact same area. They have dimensions of A plus B and B plus A, A plus B and B plus A, um, except by rearranging these, these beige tiles, the triangles, uh, we can rearrange them to find areas of A squared and B squared, which has to be equal to the area of the hypotenuse squared, which is absolutely amazing. Now what's really cool is that geometry, before we had variables uh, in algebra to, to be able to incorporate to our proofs, geometry was based on visual proofs and diagrams just like this. So um, Euclid would go out there in the sand and he would draw this diagram and then he'd write behold, probably in Greek, and then he'd do his like stick drop or mic drop and he'd walk away and people like, oh, he's so cool. I wanna be like him when I grow up said no one. Okay. Anyway, so another way I can show this is by uh, finding the area of, through deconstruction. Two methods, we can do A plus B times A plus B, and then we can do FOIL. So we do the first, which is A times A is A squared, uh, the outside and the inside, which is going to be the 2AB, and then the last, which is going to be the B squared, 
or we can find the area by deconstructing it into the individual pieces. So each one of these A and B is going to be A, B divided by 2. So base times height divided by 2, base times height divided by 2, base times height divided by 2, and then the one in the middle is our C squared. So 4, 1 half AB squared, or ABs, is going to be 2AB, and then the C squared. Now we're almost there. You can probably see where we're going with this. When we subtract the 2AB, we're left with the A squared plus B squared is equal to the C squared, which is, again, another proof for the Pythagorean theorem. And so cool. Um, I also like to, with the smart board, it allows me to go even more, be even more efficient with how I teach. And so it allows me to uh, go back and reteach all the prerequisite material that students might have not had the best experience with last year, especially um, this year, uh, to guarantee that students don't struggle with prerequisite material when we're learning new applications of that material. So one of the big things that I have to do is reteach solving equations and algebraic properties and identities with, um, in, in order to be able to apply those to solving equations in geometry. So we talk about a balance beam and how these equations, these two expressions are equal to each other. That's why it's an equation. So whatever x is for some value, that's a constant value, we just don't know what it is, it's allowing this side to be equal to the expression of 36. So if I want to unravel this expression to leave the x by itself to solve for that value, I first have to get rid of this 4. So if I subtract 4 from one side, what used to be balanced is now no longer balanced. So I have to subtract 4 from the other side to make it balanced. Balance. That's going to be the subtraction property of equality. If I subtract the same thing from both sides and I remove the 4 uh, at the same time, then it's going to remain balanced the entire time. So then we can, these add up to their inverse operations of each other. So they add up to the additive identity of 0, leaving us with 2x squared is equal to 32. The next step would be to get rid of this multiplication of 2. We undo multiplication with division. If I cut both sides in half, that's going to be the division property of equality. Or if you're multiplying it by 1 half, you could also say the multiplication property of equality, which is going to leave us with with x squared is equal to 16. Now, this is an exponent. I don't want x squared, I just want x. So I can undo an exponent with uh, a square root, which is going to be the exponential property of equality. If I take the square root of both sides, they're going to remain constant and equal the entire time, leaving us with our final solution, uh, which was always the value of x, which x had to be equal to 4. And if I substitute it back into the original expression, sure enough, I would get 36. Uh, more beautiful, powerful visuals. This is talking about angles of depression and elevation. The, it's so easy to apply this to situations in the real world. Um, and this is something that I would have on the board as the students walk in, just kind of as a, a teaser to try to get them interested in what we're about to talk about. And asking questions, what would an angle of elevation depression do? And what does it have to do with eye level? So we can talk because of uh, the eye levels are going to be parallel to each other. Our angles of depression are from eye level looking down depression and angles of elevation from eye level are looking up again notice they're color coded so they can see where these things are coming from uh, also what does it mean to be eye level well eye level is not like parallel to the ground because the ground's actually round so instead we have to um, we have to say that they are tangent to uh, the radius going through the point of tangency directly below them and since they're both tangent to this to the same to the same radius they are going to be parallel to each other uh, meaning that the angles of elevation and angles of depression are going to be alternate interior angles. All right, so another application is with trig for angles of elevation and depression. So here we have Dusty Cropper uh, fighting uh, forest fires. I can tell you that he's uh, 10,000 square feet, which is pretty typical for light sport aircraft. We want to know how far away he is from, um, from the fire. And I think the other information we get is that the angle of depression is going to be uh, 30 degrees. So we have a 30 degree angle of depression, meaning our angle of elevation is exactly the same, uh, meaning that's also going to be 30 degrees. So I can label my side. Um, with respect to 30, the uh, 10,000 is going to be the opposite leg. The adjacent leg is the side we're trying to solve for. So looking over here with Sokoto, which again, color coded, which trig function relates the opposite to the adjacent. Again, I'm not using the hypotenuse, so I can't use sine and cosine. So it would be the tangent function. So the tangent of our angle is 30 is going to be equal to the opposite side, which is 10,000 divided by x. Whenever we are dividing by x, we just swip, uh, switch these two. It's like multiplying by x and dividing by tangent of 30. Uh, so we put in the calculator is 10,000 divided by tangent of 30. Uh, another thing that I want to show you uh, with, with the trig problems is that a lot of times the diagrams are not exactly what you need. And so, for instance, I found this shape art of this house with, um, with the trees in the front, and then I built the ramp using just line tools like I have here. Um, and so this is actually like pretty much built by me. So let me change that. So this is the original house that I had uh, that I found the shape art for. And then you could see how I built the ramp around it, which is kind of cool.
Another uh, application is uh, to show them properties of inscribed angles by, it's really Thales theorem, which I actually show them at the beginning of the year, but the central angle is 180 degrees on the diameter. And then if we put uh, a third vertice anywhere on the semicircle, it's going to create all possible right triangles with the hypotenuse length of the diameter. So as I move this around the space, this inscribed angle, because it has a vertice on the circle itself, is going to always be half of the measurement of the inscribed angle or the central angle. So uh, all possible right triangle or combinations of leg lengths of right triangles, which is really important to understand the equation of a circle, by the way, um, are all going to be shown here uh, and can be visualized and shown in, in movement and in real time. Instead of showing them an example of one and then trying to show them another static example of another one, they can really get it, uh, get it down, whoa, 270, back to 90. <laughs> they really see what's happening there. One of my favorite applications, uh, I'm really showing you all my cool stuff, but anyway, one of my favorite applications is with tangent lines and circles has to do with how high you are above sea level and how far you can see. So your distance above sea level, like for instance, in the International Space Station, which is uh, 350 kilometers uh, in orbit above uh, sea level, the uh, the hypotenuse length is just adding the radius to the, the angle of, the, sorry, your uh, elevation above sea level and then the leg of the distance is just going to be another leg of the right triangle because um, tangent lines the furthest point you'd be able to see until the earth curves away from you you can't see past it um, would be just a point of tangency which is always going to make a right triangle this allows us to be able to do uh, the pythagorean theorem pretty simply it's a really cool application of the pythagorean theorem where uh, students can see these things so one of the fun things if i actually drew this to scale is this is actually if this was the earth this is how close they're orbiting in the international space station because they're traveling really really fast uh, and so they can actually only see a very slight small uh, portion of the earth and i can show them pictures from space from the international space station showing they can only see about 20.6 uh, percent of all of the earth which is really cool in fact you see how large italy is in this they can only see about the width of the gulf of mexico so for uh for long periods of time all they can see is just ocean 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 then it's like florida that's pretty cool <laughs> uh, to put that into context really doing space math which I, i'm a bit of a fan all right, so uh, what about from the moon, the distance of the moon? Certainly, we can see much more um, by using inverse cosine. I can actually figure out uh, that we can see about 98.96% of half of the Earth from the moon because we're so far away. That leads us to uh, be able to work backwards and to estimate how far away they were uh, from the Apollo 17 mission when they took the famous photo of the blue marble um, based on, oh, we act, um, I'm not going to go through it, but the video I made, we were able to kind of like triangulate how far away you are from the earth by, based on how large uh, Africa is and what percent of the earth we think we can see in our field of view. Uh, we actually got it really, really close, which is a ton of fun. So different perspectives and space math all having to do with tangents and um, applications of the Pythagorean theorem. So it's really actually pretty simple math. Uh, we also get into um, other controversial topics like is the Apollo 11 faked? So if there was uh, multiple light sources, then there would be discrepancy in the lengths of the shadows. Um, all the rays of the sun that are coming from such a far distance, there are all the rays that hit the earth are all essentially going parallel to each other. And so they won't uh, show discrepancies. Anything that's closer than that or multiple light sources is going to show um it's, it, it's going to show discrepancies in the, in the ratios. So by measuring from photos the heights and then the distances of the shadows, we're able to compare them. They should be similar triangles with the same angle of elevation for the sun at that time. Um, and so they should be really close to each other. The only limitation here is, of course, the measurements, the precision of the measurements that I can make. Uh, so we do that with several photos, which is kind of fun. Uh, and see they're all fairly close and so not not close enough that kids that thought it was fake still think it was fake uh, but still kind of fun just that we can investigate stuff like that then uh, kind of the grand finale the coolest stuff that I've been able to get into is actually non-euclidean geometry so uh, I think a few years ago two or three years ago students were really struggling with not only thinking Tide Pods were edible but also thinking that you uh, that the world was flat so I don't know why there was a resurgency of that after um, you know 400 years or whatever. So I decided that I would try to get into spherical geometry and try to show my students even possibly a proof for the world being flat. So uh, really high level stuff. I mean, non-Euclidean geometry is usually reserved for a college-based course, but with my honors geometry kids and the powerful visuals I've got, I think I can actually teach them how to do it. So the first thing we need to know is the difference between small circles, circumferences, and great circles. So uh, a great circle is the largest possible circle way you could split a, a sphere exactly in half. Um, it'll always go through the center point as well. So if you notice, the small circles don't go through the center point, but the like the equator and the primary um, they will all go through the center. 
Now, the reason why great circle circumferences are so important is because that's always the shortest distance between two points on a spherical geometry. So if we're going from here to here, if you notice, we're not actually following one of these lines of latitude. It looks like we're actually going curving up and then curving back down. That's because that's the shortest distance between the two points. And that distance, that great circle circumference, will always pass through uh, the equator twice and will also pass through the prime meridian twice. So if we continued going in a straight line, we'd always go in and without following a coordinate, we'd always create a great circle circumference. So uh, showing the difference between that is can be shown with latitude and longitude as well, which we do in a, in a problem where we're uh, trying to estimate the width of China uh, by using um, coordinates. So uh, all of our lines of latitude here are all going to be small circles. There's only one of them, the you know the equator that actually is a great circle circumference. But what's interesting is, um, and you know, can also get into the latitudes, basically how many degrees we are above the circumference, and that's how they're that's how they're done. But anyway, uh, the lines of longitude, however, are all going to be great circle circumferences that go through the center point, uh, and so they're going to be the shortest distance between uh, two points that are on the same longitude. So a proof that the Earth is round. If we had a flat Earth, then uh, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle would be 180 degrees instead of 270 degrees. So one thing that we can do is imagine um, going along the equator a certain distance, and then we can take a right turn and then go that same distance again. Now, as this is being graphed out with the flat Earth in two dimensions, we can see what this would look like on the real Earth, which is round, by the way. Um, and so we take another right turn, and then we go our final distance, the same distance again and because the earth is flat we actually end up back where we started you can see all the great circle circumferences going on here which is really cool uh, however if the earth was flat we'd have to do that a fourth time um, which we don't have to because the earth is round and the sum of the interior angles of the triangle is actually 270 degrees instead of 180 degrees depending on the curvature of the earth so that presents into three different types of geometry, elliptical, hyperbolic, and then Euclidean, which is what we usually stick with for the rest of the year. Uh, so with the elliptical, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is going to be greater than 180 degrees, as you can see here. With hyperbolic, it's actually less because they're curving in instead of uh, being... Uh, they're convex or concave instead of being convex another way of thinking about it then with euclidean they're exactly equal to 180 degrees now this comes from the euclidean uh, euclid's parallel postulate or this infamous fifth postulate with you with the ecliptical uh, with sorry with the elliptical we have uh, lines that all curve uh, and they all curve down so in fact there's if you go straight in any direction you'll always cross the equator twice and so there are no parallel lines with elliptical uh, geometry with hyperbolic geometry because they're curving away there are infinitely many lines that are parallel that pass through some point c that's not on the line ac uh, but with euclidean there's exactly one parallel line that passes through c uh, and it's a unique one so that's a really important theorem and that we can actually get into thinking about different shapes and different uh, shapes of plane and, you, and Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry uh, and be able to explain those things. Honestly, I wouldn't have the confidence to do it if I didn't have the illustrations and the smartboard skills with the animations to be able to back it up uh, and to be able to bring my students into some really rigorous lessons. So I hope you enjoyed me sharing with you my best practices for use of smart board technology with uh, honors geometry in particular. I want to share an example uh, that came that from yesterday from my own life, uh, watching my nephew solve a puzzle. Uh, so I think this demonstrates the shortfalls of how we try to incorporate and train teachers to use and incorporate technology in their classroom. So um, my my nephew uh, when I when I came home, my nephew. Uh, was was playing uh, was solving a puzzle and uh, I was he had only put a few pieces together so I was curious what the puzzle looked like so of course I looked over at the box and I pointed oh you're doing a cars puzzle very cool uh, he did not want me to show him the picture he thought that was cheating he pushed the puzzle away from me and he turned his head away because uh, he did not want to see what the final big picture looked like instead he was focused on all the small little minute details of just trying to match pieces together finding one piece and another piece and then rotating it four ways until we found one that, that actually fit together. Uh, so by focusing on all the small details instead of the big picture, uh, he, he kind of missed the whole point and uh, uh, would have had the motivation and, and to know what was actually going on. So by sharing the best practices instead of going into all the detail of how I made those slides, I can show you what can be done with smart technology and leaving you to discover how I did it on your own. In fact, if you want to know all the tools, uh, if I went through and I uh, and I think a lot of training in the past is focused on specifically teaching all the tools out devoid of the context of where you'd use them in, in your content, uh, then it might look something like this. If you right click uh, on an image, 
Um, you can lock it in place. You can allow vertical, horizontal move. You can allow it to move and rotate. Uh, you can flip the image left and right. You can order it, bring it forward or backwards with your layering, which is very important. You can also set image transparency. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so those are all the tools that I've used to be able to create all these slides. Now, um, going through and teaching you how to do all those and how that works. So if I click this and I um, go to lock and uh, allow vertical move, now it only moves vertically, which could become helpful. Yes, I can teach you how to do that. I also, of course, have them all, all the shortcuts memorized because I do them so often. But, um, uh, but basically what I wanted you to see is that we need to focus on sharing best practices to inspire teachers to be able to uh, become more comfortable and to find more innovative ways to incorporate new technology into the classroom, to provide powerful visuals, whatever's going on in your head, how you want to teach it, how you want to explain it. Uh, be able to use the smart notebook software uh, and the smart art tools and stuff like that to be able to construct something that goes along with and guide students through the process of learning. So I, I hope you enjoy this and I hope I've inspired you to also share your own best practices for how you incorporate technology into the classroom and how you uh, add more rigor and make your teaching more efficient to be able to get into more rigor uh, and a better pre-teaching of, of prerequisite material, uh, teaching tested material better, and then being able to go beyond the tested material uh, into real world applications and, and just make the whole process uh, uh, inspiring and memorable for the students as I know uh, math is and math can be. So I hope you have a good one and I'll, I'll see you later. Bye.